right here, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Kaufman Foundation, which is defined in the support of this work. Um, we see lots about the SRES submission scenarios, and uh, you know, there's you know, really an extraordinarily broad range of these heading up to 2100, ranging from some version of business as usual to, at the high end, to what I heard yesterday someone called the Kumbaya scenarios at the uh, low end. And of course, this calls uh, problems for predictions of future global climate change. Um, it turns out that the uncertainty in temperature prediction of the future are as much due to uh, these SRES scenario variability as due to any uncertainty in climate physics. Now, what I wonder is that, is that well, looking at this plot here, historically the problem actually looks to be much more constrained than the SRES scenarios make it look out to be. This is the atmospheric CO2 perturbation of the pre-industrial levels plotted on the log log plot against the world GDP um, using available statistics for the past 2,000 years. And what you can see is that you know, it looks like it's almost a straight line to the point where one could even imagine going to the top of one low any time of this, in the past 2,000 years and measuring the size of the global world economy with a CO2 probe. Uh, so I you know, started to look at this wondering what might be the cause of uh, these um, fundamentally constrained uh, plots if that, well, that's what they may be. I must admit this is a very amateurish attempt. I'm not an economist. I have a background in economist economics. I am just a mere cloud physicist. And uh, I tried to approach this problem as a basic government manner problem. Uh, how what would the economic system look like if we were to approach it as fundamentally being a physics problem? And I wrote a paper on this at a rather difficult time. It was rejected ten times by various journals before it was accepted by climatic change with Steven Schneider as the direct editor, and he was uh, far more open-minded, thankfully, but then, you know, very sadly, he passed away, and uh, new editorial leadership took over, and the problems uh, started once again, seven months after the paper was formally accepted. They solicited strongly critical commentaries on this work, and uh, that were to appear alongside my piece, and one of them, well, this is a basic tenor of these, uh, articles say one of them included a reference to this cartoon here. That's here alongside my piece where you can read it. But, uh, the basic gist of it, as you can read here on the bottom, is that uh, obviously physicists shouldn't be playing in the economist's sandbox. So, uh, anyway, the, uh, the basic physics of this is this is how um, I approach a problem is to treat it like an open field dynamic system, which of course we're all familiar with. Because the atmosphere works this way, we can think about there being a material energetic flow, according to the second law of thermodynamics, from high available potential energy density to low potential <laughs> energy density. I refer to avoid the term entropy because I find it confusing. But this is functionally equivalent. And so we have high density energy density sunlight that comes in, that drives the uh, circulations of the atmosphere at the lower potential level. You see this downward material flow, then ultimately there is dissipation to space with low energy um, photons that are radiated over four plus radians rather than the 10 to the minus fifth radians for the sun. Now, just to replace it with these oil derricks or whatever the energy supplies are for civilization, it's functionally the same problem for the economy, I think, which is that we have high available energy density uh, fuel supplies in various forms, including fossil fuels. Which or most of it, in fact, that drive all the circulations within civilization along another potential level, and we call these circulations trade. And then ultimately, all these activities lead again to dissipation of the space at the cold black body temperature of 255 K. Now, the analogy I like to think for this is that civilization is actually a little bit different than the economy because it's growing so extraordinary, uh, sorry, it's a bit different than the atmosphere because it's growing so extraordinarily rapidly. And here it's nice to think about perhaps a child as being a suitable analogy for the global economy. Here's a picture of my son, he's three year old. Um, he's an open thermodynamic system, of course. There's circulations within it, and he consumes energy um, at, in order to grow and sustain his current circulations. At the same time, there's a you know, constant circulation to reach out for more energy from the apple tree. And this not only sustains its current size, but if there is net convergence of energy, he is able to grow. So if he consumes more energy than he dissipates to space, ultimately, then he grows to a larger size, which entails a positive feedback that leads to consuming more energy. 
prosperity, such that my son is an eight-year-old, is now much bigger, and consumes much more food than he did as a three-year-old. Uh, and so this is, you can imagine there being an efficiency issue in here, that if my son is efficient and healthy, you will grow faster than if he is sick, in which case his efficiency might be actually negative, in which case he is actually shrinking. So an efficient economy, uh, or system might be actually more energy consumption. So the perspective here is to think, well, how do we represent this fiscal? Now, this is simply a hypothesis, is that this potential energy difference is perhaps what we value fiscally, because it's this potential energy difference that drives the flows of potential energy into civilization that enables all of civilization's activities to occur. And perhaps we quantify this gradient, or the rate of flow into civilization, with a fiscal quantity, which we might refer to as a wealth. And the GDP, which is what we hear about most often, is simply the convergence of wealth. If more energy comes into civilization that's dissipated into space, then there's a net convergence of civilization that leads civilization to expand. Okay, and this is what we quantify as the GDP. Now, of course, this is a positive feedback because a net expansion of civilization means it expands to new energy reservoirs. And new energy reservoirs, just like my sun, mean that it consumes more energy in the future. And if it does this efficiently, then it will accelerate faster and faster into, um, you know, to continue its growth. Now, of course, if we may run out of fuel, and there could be net um, divergence such that civilization starts shrinking. So it loses more of the space and begins growing the above. Okay, so there's a possible possibility for a positive feedback here. Now, to represent this mathematically, we have wealth, which is units of dollars, that's related through a constant, a hypothesized constant, to, to the current rate of energy consumption. Where wealth is an inter time integral of the past convergence of flows, which is represented fiscally as the GDP, which is what we all hear about. This is all done at global scales, not at national scales. I can say nothing about national scales because those are inside the system. They cannot be resolved. This is a global scale argument. This point is here. So energy consumption is proportional to global economic wealth. Wealth is an accumulation of past real economic production. This is effectively a relative system, like any other physical system. And the key point here is that this is hypothesis, hypothesized to be a constant coefficient representing the power of money. And look, an economist would find a sample. They would just, I, I get horrible criticism from face with this. This is not their model. But unlike their models, this is actually testable and falsifiable. And theirs can make any arbitrary level of complexity to the point that they're always right. They cannot actually be discarded, unfortunately. This could be discarded because I can test this. I can say, if this is not actually constant with time, then this model is wrong. Well, as it turns out, it is actually constant with time based on the available data that I can use to test this. Here's global wealth on a logarithmic plot using the data that's available for energy consumption, which is shown here, from 1970 to 2010. And what we see here is that in current day, we have about $1,600 trillion, about $1990 of wealth, that is supported by about 16 terawatts of power consumption. Um, in 1970, both of these quantities were about half that. And the ratio of these two quantities, lambda, which is this green line, appears to be basically constant with time, which is supporting the hypothesis I made. Turns out that it's about 90, 10 milliwatts per 1990 US dollar. So if I held up the dollar bill, that's just a piece of paper, except that in, there is power consumption that sustains that value and turns that dollar bill into something that actually can do things. Turn off all the lights to civilization, and all of civilization is worthless. We'd all be dead and nothing else. So um, it's power and this money. This is the basic message. So I come back to this. This is what the IPCC says. They have a much more complicated perspective on this, which is, as you can read here, they say it's a very complex dynamic system, determined by driving forces such as demographic development, socioeconomic development, and technological change. The future evolution is highly uncertain, which basically means it's highly unconstrained. And I'm saying, well, no, it isn't highly unconstrained because the present is fundamentally a function of the past. We have the past world GDP, which is determining current wealth and the current rate of energy consumption. We are evolving slowly. We are changing our rate of energy consumption, but only quite slowly because the system is effectively relative. Now, we can 
change out to the emissions by simply multiplying by the carbonization of the energy supply, which is this coefficient A. This part here, so coefficient C, <coughs> this part here will be common to both perspectives. What's different here is that energy consumption is fundamentally tied to the wealth of civilization, which is fundamentally tied to the tax convergence <coughs> of the flows. So what does this mean? You look at this. It's a rather depressing message, which means that without decarbonizing, we can only reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide by destroying civilization. That is, the only, that is the only possible option. We have to destroy civilization to do that. But we can't do that quickly because we're stuck with what we already have. We've accumulated the past, the past is with us, and the past cannot be erased. So I tried to turn this into prognostic form into a paper that's in uh, Review of Earth System Dynamics in its final stages. And I tried to point out the rather hopelessness of the situation. It's now up at 20 comments, which is, I think, the record for the journal. Most of, some of them are quite abusing of vitriol, but they are. And so this is the, uh, the prognostic form of this model. Here's just uh, energy consumption, at least the energy consumption growth with a certain rate of return. And that feeds back on energy consumption. So we have a positive feedback here. This is basically identical to the models that are used in uh, plant growth models. This is, it all things essentially identical to plant growth models. Uh, and then this is linked to the constant lambda. Energy consumption is linked to wealth through the constant. Energy consumption growth is linked to real GDP. If we fail to grow our energy consumption, GDP will become negative. The real GDP will become negative, implying hyperinflation. Energy consumption leads to carbon dioxide emissions. Some of it disappears into the ocean. Some of it accumulates in the atmosphere. And you can imagine that the CO2 in the atmosphere may ultimately do us in in one form or another. Of course, we could debate about this, but it could be something that could uh, be effectively parameterized. And we can make forecasts into the future. Um, and this is sort of a test of it. Here's the high cast, which are carbon dioxide concentrations here, gross world product here in the blue. And I used an initialization for the model in 1985. There's no tuning in this model. Yet this model is able to make accurate high cast from 1985 up to the present for both GDP and carbon dioxide concentrations. And I don't think there's other economic models I can do, do multi-decadal forecasts for GDP with this degree of accuracy. But it's thermal dynamically constrained, so I think you know, it's not surprising. Going out to 2100. Um, this is a similar plot to what I showed before. Here is the observed values for 180 to 2008, this dash line. Atmospheric CO2 is here, commercial product is here. The SRAS scenarios has us getting insanely rich, while the world rapidly increases its carbon dioxide concentration. They have us incredible changes over the next century compared to the past 2,000 years. The more thermodynamically constrained model has us continuing along the same line as the past if we were completely resilient to carbon dioxide changes, which would be this case. Now, moving to the left, this is, these mean lines are the years right here. Moving to the left is um, decreasing resilience to CO2 concentrations. So we might see perhaps CO2 going up, but our wealth does not increase as much because there is, I guess, environmental predation to the natural disasters. But the only solution that leads to stabilization is this one, right here, which has stabilization at something like 600 ppmp, but it requires net civilization divergence, which means a form of civilization collapse. Okay, now this doesn't allow for decarbonization, but the decarbonization will have to be quite rapid in order to have much of an impact on this plot. So the reason the SRAS models get these unphysically high wealth values is because they assume that energy consumption can be decoupled from the decline. And thermodynamically, at least based on the testable hypothesis I presented, that does not appear to be the case. So in conclusion, um, civilization's future is tied to its past, like any other physical system in the universe. Um, wealth, energy consumption, and CO2 emissions seem to be coupled to a cross. We'll all go up and down eventually together. Um, energy efficiency gains, contrary to what is normally portrayed, will lead to accelerated growth of wealth, the back super exponential growth of CO2 emissions, if we increase um, the energy efficiency. And then, of course, there's negative feedbacks on this, which is, of course, CO2 emissions could come back to bite us in one form or another, and that could be um, a drag on civilization growth, leading to less CO2 emissions ultimately. Or we could 
simply run out of energy reservoirs. Um, and I think I'd like to conclude by asking this question, which is that, you know, we have these GCMs, and we're, we're so deeply like in the physics right in the GCMs, yet we drive these GCMs with these things that are based on no physics whatsoever. And that seems like very unhappy marriage to me, shouldn't the SRS team always be expected to have the physics too? a scenario in the future and take a specific example. Uh, and so does wealth include uh, paying a price for the environment? Uh, so let me, let me finish with this. So, and let me pick, uh, uh, for example, something like air capture of CO2. So the direct extraction of CO2 from the atmosphere will cost energy. So you have to burn more energy, create more jobs. Is that something that represents a divergence in your uh, framework? Okay, so I mean, for one thing, um, you're asking me to go out on a limb here because no, you're no, I'm not. I'm just well, but you are a bit because you're asking because you're asking me to go inside the system, where and look at specific things that happen inside the system where my approach is to treat the system as a whole. But I will say this: that um, anything that requires energy consumption and does not lead to a direct gain in future wealth is not going. It's it's probably not going to be popular, I'm guessing, because it's going to be effectively wasted energy, where other energy might be more profitable in the immediate term. <coughs> of course, in the long term, you know, there might be bigger advantages, but um, I don't know, the civilization can it plan further into the future? I'm not sure there's any evidence that it is doing that, right? No. Uh, one thing you may want to consider, you may want to consider whether you're lowercase c, the carbonization coefficient, is a real constant, or it can vary with time. Well, okay, uh, I will show you actually. For example, uh, uh, if there is a geological uh, limitation, in other words, if uh, energy fuel costs become very high, and nuclear energy becomes truly competitive and even cheaper, then the carbonization constant will decrease as a function of time. Now, I did I did those simulations. They're actually right here. Sure. So this needs to be taken into account. Yeah, I, I, I take this into account. This is, this, I've done the, I didn't show this in the talk, but I, I, I consider those possibilities that the carbonization will change. But it has to happen very rapidly. So you can an idea, um, just to stabilize emissions based on carbonization changes alone, you have to build about the equivalent of one nuclear power plant today. Because effectively, we are building one gigawatt per day of new power production capacity currently. And assuming like a nuclear power plant is one gigawatt, we would have to build the equipment. But you can build the gigawatts with nuclear power and not emit any CO2. Okay, sure. He says he's included that. Here. Hello. 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 Uh, Chris? Yeah. Uh, when I have seen talks attempting to connect thermodynamics to economics before, I've seen a few over the years. Usually, uh, one of the things the thermodynamics side uh, tends to insert into this discussion is that rather than an energy analysis, they do energy analysis, or available energy as opposed to just energy. And it tends to change things in various ways. Why did you not Follow that route. No, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm just, well, I'm saying available potential energy density. That's, it's actually the same as XRT. I just think it's nuts to introduce new words if you don't have to. Available potential energy is the term we're all familiar with. Why not stick with it? So I am doing XRT analysis as well. 